Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I'm really excited to see people tuning in from literally all over the world. And that's definitely been one of my favorite things on this platform is being able to stay connected with people globally. So we really appreciate you being here. I wanna wish everyone a very happy and healthy new year to start things off. You're all here because you recognize the need to understand where the market, where the supplement market and the health and wellness market is heading in a world where consumers are increasingly aware of the power of botanicals to support short and long-term wellness. As you all know, this is a, a big day, a day of changes. And one thing that will remain constant is that consumers need to feel empowered to take control of their health. That's one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about the supplement industry is because it provides accessible health and wellness solutions to people globally. Today, we're going to be looking at some of the consumer health trends of 2021 and beyond, and the botanicals and solutions that can be used to address these most common health issues and concerns. We'll be looking at the top conditions and trends that are driving supplement sales growth through Nutrition Business Journal and Next Data. And we'll also be looking at the very specific ingredients and solutions that can help ensure that we're delivering these to consumers when they need them most. Plus, the American Botanical Council will look at issues related to quality and authenticity in the supplement industry because it's really important that we keep these top of mind as we look at the trends and we look at the ingredients and make sure that we are all coming to together to support quality and authenticity. As you have questions over the course of the three great presentations that we're going to see today, please make sure that you submit them. I see you all chatting in the chat box. Keep doing that. Let us know where you're tuning in from and anything that's on your mind related to the botanicals industry and make sure that you submit your questions there as well because at the end of our presentation, we'll have some time to, to get to all of those questions. And finally, make sure that you use this platform as it's intended. So after the presentation today, make connections. You can send connections requests to our team at Natural Remedies, to any of our speakers. And from there, you can literally have video calls and stay connected person to person, one-on-one -on -one in the platform. Again, I love that. It's so cool. So please make sure that you take advantage of that functionality. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our first presenters today, Claire Morton Reynolds, who is the Senior Industry Analyst at Nutrition Business Journal, and Eric Pierce, Vice President of Business Insights at Informa Health and Nutrition. Once again, thank you all for being here. And Claire and Eric, I am going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jessica, and hello, everyone. I am Claire Morton Reynolds, the Senior Industry Analyst for Nutrition Business Journal, and I'm joined here today with my colleague, Eric Pierce, New Hope and Next Vice President of Business Insights. And we are so excited to share our insights and thoughts of the, on the top trends for 2021 and beyond. The events of 2020 obviously shifted so many consumer trends and patterns, so we're looking at the years to come through a different lens than ever before. But what is interesting is kind of throughout this presentation, you'll see unique trends as a result of 2020, but also trends that were pervasive before last year and will continue to be pervasive in the years to come um, and really have that staying power. Um, so we've got a data packed presentation for you today and I'm just gonna dig right in. Um, so in the next slide, I'm going to start with a global view of the supplement industry, and then we'll narrow it down to the U.S. market and focus on trends specific to the U.S. So we see here, global supplement sales are projected to grow 9.5% this year to $156 billion. We're seeing a spike in sales across nearly almost every corner of the world, which is historic, really, in NBJ's tracking of the industry. Uh, in fact, this is the first year where we are reporting no regions of sales decline across the world, sales are up. Um, but the impact of the COVID pandemic has seemed to be directly related to growth trends. And there's a lot of nuance here by country and region. 
in countries like the US and regions like Latin America, uh, growth has spiked into the double digits for supplements, uh, but the growth trend has been much more normal and smooth in countries like Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. And when we think about looking forward into 2021, um, what we think this tells us across global markets is that we can really continue to forecast supplement growth um, and supplement growth trends in direct relation to kind of how COVID-19 is being handled, and especially now that we're watching this vaccine roll out across the world. In the pie on the right, you can see that the US market represents just over a third of global sales, and the overall growth trend tends to somewhat follow the US leads, um, but there's obviously a lot of nuance, like I said, across these global regions. Going on to the next slide, this chart breaks out the global market by high level product categories. Uh, so in 2020, we see vitamins and minerals, uh, which is represented here in gray, made up the largest single market share with about 60 billion in sales, followed by the kind of combined sports nutrition, meal supplement, homeopathic and specialty market um, at just over 50 billion. And finally here, uh, herbs and botanicals represented in that darkish blue, um, which is the smallest um, by single market share. Um, but what's interesting is kind of, while it's the smallest of the three, if we move on to the next slide, we see a different view. Um, so here we see a huge sales spike of growth in 2020 as a direct result of the pandemic um, by our estimates. And so we see here in that gold trend line, global urban botanical sales growth uh, surpasses 10% in 2020, uh, bringing that global market to just over 40 billion. Um, and here is a term I'm gonna kind of use throughout. We see this, what we're calling a stair step pattern. So we see from the bars in the green on the left um, to the bars in the right in gray, moving from our historic uh, actuals into our projections that, that we have this permanent lift. Um, so when I say that stair step pattern, we've really moved up a level in kind of a permanent way. We're not seeing sales return back to a pre-pandemic level. And Global Herbs and Botanicals is a great example of that. On the next slide, I want to touch briefly, still focusing on herbs and botanicals, um, but looking at the regional comparison. So on the left is a pie breakout of herbs and botanicals by region compared to the total market breakout on the right. And it's interesting, there are certainly some regional differences in this breakout. We see that the US makes up significantly less of the global urban botanical market when compared to total supplements, whereas we see largely Asian countries over indexing on herbs and botanical sales as a percent of the total urban botanical market. Um, and also, like interestingly, we do see generally stronger growth in the countries that are under indexing on the left. So, for example, the US has one of the strongest uh, growth rates in herbs and botanicals um, because it is a smaller market with a little bit more runway. And speaking of the US market, the next slide focuses in on the US market. And again, this is what the remainder of our presentation will focus on. Um, so 2020 was obviously a record year for supplement sales. MBJ projected growth at about 12.1%, blowing past the $50 billion benchmark and reaching $54 billion last year. And for context, this is actually the highest growth rate we've seen since 1997, when the industry was just 14 billion annually. The pie on the right here represents industry sales by product category. And obviously, there are some categories and conditions really driving that high growth rate this year, uh, namely vitamins um, and herbs and botanicals. Um, and as we focus on 2021 and beyond, the key question I'm hearing from our industry is, what is the lasting impact? What is the halo effect? What does the normalization look like? And again, I come back to that stair step terminology. And here we see, I guess now we're looking at kind of light blue on the left and dark blue on the right. Um, again, that permanent lift to the industry. And the largest lift is really coming, we see in 2020 and 2021, um, but with a lasting impact we see of over a billion um, in, in estimates over our pre-COVID estimates. So moving on to the next slide. I'm actually gonna hand it over to my colleague, Eric, to start digging into some of those specific trends underneath that high level data. Fabulous, thanks, Claire. 
Hello, everyone. Good day to you. Um, yeah, so I think let's transition a little bit. We're going to talk about innovation trends as we look to, to 2021. Uh, so we're going to shift a little bit to talk about which innovation trends have the greatest potential in the U.S. consumer marketplace. Our analysis is, uh, in our analysis, we set out to identify which trends consumers and the industry are most excited about. Uh, the results, we hope, will help you prioritize where to focus your innovation energy as you work to address today's uh, consumers' modern health needs. Next slide, please. Um, all right, so first, let me provide a little bit of context on the trends we include in the analysis. Uh, we are going to focus on a cluster of trends which group around the topic of modern health. Uh, the modern health era has its pros and cons, uh, its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, life is busy and chaotic, and consumers are feeling the pressure to fulfill many responsibilities and endeavors. In doing so, consumers are looking to solutions for what ails them and, as well, looking to lead a life of proactive uh, life of, a proactive life of vitality. Uh, they're doing this. They're looking for these solutions through a mix of ancient holistic health practices and modern health solutions. Smart brands today have noticed that consumers want a bit of a change and are no longer happy with the apathetic status quo. And instead, brands are responding with innovative solutions to today's modern health needs. They're doing so with functional food, supplements, uh, good nutrition, and lifestyle products. Uh, these are the types of innovation trends that we're going to be talking about today. Next slide. There are 20 trends in the modern health cluster that we're going to talk about. Uh, in the interest of time, we may uh, today we're going to explore just a select number of these. So let me tell you quickly about some of the trends that we're going to feature in the analysis. Uh, first is the endocannabinoid system. This is our CBD trend, though it's purposely much bigger than just CBD, and it reflects uh, other innovative ways brands are innovating around the endocannabinoid, endocannabinoid system more broadly. The quest ref for rest reflects innovation tied to stress, sleep, and energy. So for the conversation we're having today, those of you who are interested in stress as an innovation topic, this is the trend to watch. Uh, brain health as well as a trend that we've been covering. Uh, and this it looks at innovation seeking to help consumers optimize cognitive function in a variety of different ways. Next slide. Next, we have three plant-inspired trends. Plants Elevated includes innovation that is focused on flavor and texture, uh, whole, high-quality, less processed plant-based foods that often celebrate the plantness of a product as opposed to its not-meatness. Uh, as well, we have Eat More Plants, which includes innovative solutions to helping consumers find easy ways to incorporate more plants into their diets. Next slide. Time-honored ingredients is what we have next, which helps consumers find trusted food norms by innovating with ingredients that originate from times or cultures that are less adulterated by the standard American diet. For those of you, again, relevant to today's conversation, interested in herbs and botanicals and Ayurvedic herbs, this is the innovation topic to watch in our analysis slides ahead. ahead. Next slide, please. Next, we have two digestion-related trends. Uh, digestive health, which in a modern innovation context goes well beyond just solving for consumers' need for regularity. This topic now extends into the broader conversation of improved health through optimized digestion. And the healthy microbiome, which relates broadly to the microbiome, including gut health, but also extending into other functions and systems that are modulated by probiotic bacteria, and in some cases, bacteria uh, outside of our gut as well. Next slide. And our last two trends that I'm going to feature right now are immunity and inflammation. Clearly, immunity is a topic that we know is rapidly evolving. Just a caveat, the analysis I'm going to present today as it relates to immunity uh, represents much of the innovation that was happening in 2019 and into early 2020. Uh, so I would expect results for this trend to change quite a bit as we update uh, with data from the back half of 2020, as well as going into 2022. Generally speaking, innovation in this area looks like uh, both traditional prevention or efforts to boost one's immunity, but also more proactive maintenance of a healthy immune system. Uh, finally, inflammation, our analysis here includes both joint health types of innovation, but also uh, venturing into the area of the emerging conversation related to managing uh, the causes of inflammation from a more broad perspective. Next slide, please. 
Okay, let's get into our analysis. In our analysis, we set out to identify which trends U.S. consumers and the industry are most excited about, uh, right? Which ones do we think have the most potential? The results, again, are designed to help you prioritize where to focus your innovation energy in addressing consumers' modern health needs. We're going to do this analysis. In this analysis, we looked to three different data sources. We're exploring innovation activity, investment activity, and consumer and media engagement. Each of these gives us, uh, gives us a view into which trends have momentum in the market. Next slide. Our analysis will be represented in a two by two chart like the one here. For each data set, we looked at modern health trends which are experiencing the highest growth on our vertical axis and which ones have the highest uh, absolute volume of growth. That's gonna be on our horizontal axis. Next slide. In doing this analysis, our goal is to point out three different groupings of trends, uh, each with potential implications for brand action. Our first grouping is what we call our power trends. These are our high growth, high volume trends. Uh, these are the trends that you want to compete on by having the most innovative products in your portfolio. Next, we have the emerging trends. These are the high growth, but lower volume trends. Uh, these can be used to help differentiate your brand by engaging consumers in new and interesting and exciting conversations for these emerging areas. And finally, we have what might be the maturing trends. These are high volume, but lower growth trends overall. And they're the ones that you probably still want to have in your portfolio. These are probably strong drivers of sales, but it might be worthwhile to check in and monitor their sales closely to make sure they're still playing the role that you want in your portfolio. All right, next slide. Here is what our innovation, our analysis of innovation activity in modern health looks like. Um, our analysis here looks at the number of products exhibited at Natural Products Expos that were curated as examples of each trend. Here we see our power trends where the most innovation activity is including includes things like time-honored ingredients. Remember, that's where our Ayurvedic and herbs and botanicals live. Eat more plants, the endocannabinoid system, and some of our protein and plant-based protein trends. Next slide. Looking at nutritional capital networks investment data, we can see here where investors are placing their spending their money, right? We see the endocannabinoid system, brain health, sugar vilified, and eat more plants falling into our power trend quadrant for investors. But it's also exciting to see plants elevated and plant protein in that emerging space. And for our conversation today, strong mature trends uh, include brain health, time-honored ingredients, immunity, a healthy microbiome, quest for rest, that's where our stress conversation lives, um, are all doing well in that power quadrant. All right, next slide. Finally, looking to consumer and media engagement. Um, I'm going to just kind of go over this one quickly because we, I'd like to get you to the, the conclusion slides and keep us on time. But this is basically how much are consumers engaging. And again, we see a lot of the trends that we're talking about today uh, in the emerging and power trend quadrant. All right, next slide to wrap up a little bit on this section of the analysis. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's a lot of data there and we covered it quite quickly. The real question is what does it all mean and how do we simplify this and make it easier? This is a consolidated view that looks across all three data sources, ranks them, and then kind of gives you that summary. Next slide will give you sort of this in text. So translating this into our framework for brand implications, uh, we can make the following recommendations. Our power trends, again, those high growth, high volume ones that you want to compete on by having innovative solutions in your portfolio include the endocannabinoid system, time-honored ingredients, quest for rest, brain health, among others. Uh, and again, relevant to today's conversation, in that mature trend space, the ones that you want to have in your portfolio because they're mainstreaming trends most likely, but also strong drivers of sales, include things like the healthy microbiome, digestive health, inflammation, and immunity. All right. With that, I'm going to hand it back to you, Claire. Thanks, Eric. Um, so on the next slide, um, you'll see I'm going to spend the rest of this presentation taking a look at the industry by trending health conditions. And I think what's great is that um, from MBJ's perspective, we're looking at, you know, dollars spent in the market, future projections of market size, and our projections really line up with kind of that framework Eric just presented. So I think you'll see some of that echoed throughout this data. So here on the next slide, we're looking at a comparison of growth rates by health condition from 2019 to 2020. Um, so the 2020 growth on top, 2019 growth on bottom. And I think this comparison in growth has a great visual on the shift in health priorities this year. Um, and here, obviously, we start to see the rise in immunity, um, but also what we call these immune adjacent conditions. So um, stress, sleep, um, as Eric was calling it, quest for rest, um, and then general wellness as well, kind of rising 
up to the top. Um, but immunity is the clear winner this year, bringing new consumers into the fold, driving up purchases from regular supplement users as well. And on the next slide, we are zeroing in here on sales and growth of cold, flu, and immunity supplements. And interestingly, we had been seeing what we previously thought of as strong growth in immunity over the past few years, thanks to really severe flu seasons, um, with growth spiking to 9.9% .9 in 2017. But in 2020, we project growth will be over five times that growth rate, over 50%, pushing that condition permanently again. I can keep coming back to this stair step permanence, um, pushing that condition permanently past the $5 billion benchmark. And so here on the next slide, we're looking at ingredients really driving that cold flu and immunity category. So on the left, we're comparing growth by ingredient in 2020, and the pie on the right compares market share by ingredient in 2020. And so from a purely market share perspective, we see that vitamins are driving the majority of sales in immunity. Multivitamins targeting immunity hold the largest single market share at 22%, followed by vitamin C um, and a huge momentum for vitamin D in the back half of the year as well. Um, but urban botanical formulas and singles also hold really strong market share and market potential with combination formulas and elderberry singles making the top five ingredient list here. Um, and we see also elderberry on the left with the strongest growth in 2020 from an urban botanical perspective. Um, but what ingredients are we particularly focused on for 2021 and beyond? Um, so probiotics have been really interesting to watch. Um, with growth in probiotics targeting immunity specifically at over 40% this year um, and driving really a resurgence in growth for probiotics as a whole. Um, elderberry as well continues to garner attention, uh, but concerns around supply and demand have also led to attention on other berries, um, including cranberry and blueberry. And of course, vitamin D. Um, so interestingly, growth in vitamin D has been slowing from its peak, um, but we really see COVID um, and the pandemic as bringing back a resurgence in growth of vitamin D as well. So onto the next slide. Like I said, we've also been focused this year on these adjacent conditions. Um, so conditions that either support immunity or are of particular concern as a result of the effects of 2020. Um, and so one of these top conditions we see is mood, mental health, and stress. And so this kind of fits in under the trend Eric was calling quest for rest. Um, and here we're pulling out uh, mood, mental health, and stress specifically. Uh, and this category is projected to spike to 29.8% growth uh, in 2020, um, just over 1 billion as a category. And we see that consumers are increasingly understanding this interplay of sleep, stress, immunity, and overall wellness. Uh, and Eric touched on the endocannabinoid system, and this is an area that's certainly been impacted by the CBD market. And so um, we're seeing innovation across ingredients, though. Um, so we see here uh, innovation across kind of urban botanical ingredients. Um, so onto the next slide, we're looking here at brain health. Um, so to me, this is a really interesting market, um, and we have kind of two sub goals under brain health. So focus in cognition and memory. And that's where we almost start to see this new potential of this market that had really previously been kind of focused on the aging generation, looking to preserve memory. Um, but we're seeing a resurgence in growth due to that focus, cognition, kind of biohacking and optimization. And so brain health here is about a $1 billion market. And in 2020, we do see a dip in growth rate, just kind of as a result of shifting health priorities. Um, but you can see that that growth rate is really gonna resurge in the coming years um, and be kind of immune from that normalization of the overall market. Um, so growth we see in 2016 actually spiked with the emergence of the product Prevagen, um, but where we're really seeing growth now is really in herbs, botanicals, mushrooms, um, and innovation kind of across those botanical ingredients really targeting, um, optimizing, um, that focus and cognition. On the next slide here is a uh, condition with a similar growth trend. Um, and Eric really mentioned the microbiome as a potentially maturing tradition. And that's what we're seeing 
on our end as well. Um, gut health is to us really a maturing market. And that's not to say it's a declining market, um, but as I've said, that kind of stair-step pattern uh, for other conditions where we've seen this permanent boost, um, you can see here as, uh, on, on the contrary, these lines are kind of just evening out as far as a sales perspective. So um, the category is still projected to benefit in 2020 um, with a bit of recovering growth, but kind of slipping back down in the coming years. And um, so gut health peaked in 2016 at about 12.6%. Um, but again, growth has been slowing since um, in a pretty rapid way. Uh, and, and interestingly, the real momentum in recent years and in, in the coming years is around prebiotics and symbiotics. So what's really driving the maturing of this market is kind of the maturing of the probiotic only market. Um, and we really think we're in this gut health 2.0 phase where there's not as much low hanging fruit of new understanding of this market, but really consumers interested in more sophisticated formulas um, and kind of these new prebiotic and symbiotic opportunities. Uh, so moving on to the next trend in the next slide, um, really across all health conditions and goals, coming back to herbs and botanicals, they have been a bright spot in the industry. And it's interesting, I, I often put together state of the supplement industry presentations and year after year I pull in this slide and, and it's just, you know, herbs and botanicals have been outperforming um, even really bright forecasts. And obviously here we see 2020 is no exception. In fact, um, 2020 bringing more growth opportunity than ever. And another category where we're seeing that permanent boost in growth. And, and obviously that growth will dip back down. Um, this, the chart in the right here compares overall supplement growth to urban botanical growth. And we see that it kind of mimics that overall normalization curve that we're seeing across kind of all spiking categories. Um, but really across all of the conditions that I've presented today and all the conditions and trends we track, people are coming back to herbs and botanicals and looking for kind of that power of the plant. And so, um, you know, this is still a really optimistic category in our mind across really all of these trends uh, that we're capturing. So in the next slide, I just wanna wrap up kind of, I know we've put a lot out there at you and just kind of wrap up with kind of our top three takeaways, looking at all of this data we've presented really with this focus on what are the consumer trends in 2021 and beyond? So first, again, kind of this focus throughout on herbs and botanicals. The, the global urban botanical industry is very healthy. We saw a continued boost across all of those categories and conditions um, of growth in 2020 driven directly by the pandemic. Uh, and, and really that lasting boost in 2021 and beyond. The second point is that the modern era that we are in before 2020 and after 2020 has brought these unique modern health trends that our industry is truly poised to address. And finally, we saw that the pandemic has accelerated some of these trends and really shifted priorities across health conditions. So, you know, we see some of these trends that maybe took a dip in 2020. And as we kind of return to normal in 2021 and beyond, we'll have a resurgence. And then there are some trends that were accelerated in 2020 and have that, again, that stair step boost that have been permanently shifted as far as consumer health priorities. I just want to wrap by saying that, you know, from our industry perspective, we really are optimistic and motivated because more so than business opportunity, uh, what this last year has shown us is just this prioritization of health and this view of health um, and that consumer health is truly more important than ever. And we're really poised, um, poised to address those needs. And so with that, I want to say thank you very much. Um, I've included on this final slide uh, our contact information um, if you have any further questions. Um, but with that, I will hand it back to Jessica. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Claire and Eric. I get to work with Claire and Eric every day, yet I still always learn something from these presentations. And it's clear that the surge in demand for supplements will continue in throughout this year and in future years, and that this consumer health awakening, as we often call it, is really here to stay. I appreciated that com those complementary perspectives and the look at the data and, sa and sales of specific cat categories and conditions married with the trends and forces that are impacting consumer behavior. I think that's a really holistic perspective on where the industry is heading. I'm excited for our next presentation to be able to really dig into the specifics around ingredients and particularly looking at two of the things that Eric and Claire talked about, which was herbs and botanicals continuing to be a bright spot for the supplement industry, and also this shift to time-honored ingredients. But our next presentation is really going to look at the science behind these ingredients and how they can work with formulations to really address these specific conditions that Claire's talked about. So I am going to introduce Deepak Munganachadu, who is the head of health and R&D at Natural Remedies. And Maria, I saw that you had a question in the chat and keep those questions coming everyone. And I think much of what Dr. Deepak is going to be talking about today will really look at how we can instill that confidence in consumers that these products are really going to work and that herbs and botanicals when formulated properly and with the science to back them can really support an efficacious product and a quality industry. So with that, that, Dr. Deepak, I'm going to turn it to you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much for the useful insights on current market trends. Hello, everyone. I wish to talk about the clinically tested natural Ayurvedic ingredients that can support some of the health areas of interest in today's context. In our organization, we have been working in the area of natural products for long. Focus of our ingredients, which are inspired by nature, are clinical validation, environmental sustainability, and safety. Just a snapshot of our scientific endeavors with the publications and contributions to pharmacopias. We have a multidisciplinary team that work closely with each other, broadly in the areas of uh, chemistry and biology. Our uh, global presence, we are trying to contribute to the health of people across the globe with some scientifically supported Ayurvedic ingredients. Okay, uh, our uh, branded ingredients offer support in the area of uh, immunity, brain health, joint digestive health, stress and sleep. These uh, clinically supported ingredients are derived from uh, Ayurvedic botanicals. On the right hand side, uh, you can see uh, one of our solutions on respiratory health is a novel polyherbal ingredient. In the coming slides, I'll uh, take a quick uh, tour of uh, these ingredients. This is the uh, first one, which is uh, uh, derived from this plant Andrographis paniculata. Andrographis is well known in traditional systems for uh, immune health benefits, both in uh, India as well as in China. APBio, which is uh, derived from uh, Andrographis, provides a balance of healthy inflammatory response and immunity supporting benefits. These claims are supported with the three clinical studies, two of which are recently concluded.
the healthy inflammatory response uh, was seen in two clinical studies uh, in the most uh, recent one ap bio provided uh, symptomatic relief from common cold symptoms which was also supported with a couple of uh, you know objective parameters in a separate study in uh, healthy volunteers we could uh, see ap bio modulating immune responses as seen with its effects on uh, you know immune cells and interleukins so we are now publishing these uh, new studies in scientific journals ap bio works at uh, low dose 200 to 400 mg per day and uh, these are some of the immune health claims that can be made on ap bio that can in turn be supported with the clinical and preclinical studies this is the second ingredient which is derived from bacopa monirai which is uh, highly reputed in ayurveda for its uh, brain health benefits particularly in the area of uh, memory and cognition we have uh, done extensive work to understand the active chemistry of this plant and uh, develop this ingredient with nine different bioactives there are uh, five clinical studies to support its uh, health benefits and safety the ingredient uh, also has uh, grass affirmation well uh, just in a nutshell the clinical studies uh, are done in both uh, adults and children the studies are published in uh, scientific journals we have seen uh, improvements in the a in you know areas like uh, memory acquisition retention learning attention and focus feel free to seek more information from us uh, we can provide the publications the clinical studies uh, uh, you know support uh, some of these uh, specific health claims that can be made related to brain health particularly in the area of uh, learning memory and focus dose is uh, 300 to 450 mg per day and 225 mg per day for children coming to the third ingredient uh, in the area of uh, joint health this is uh, a novel ingredient derived from turmeric with an interesting if i may say product development strategy inspired from traditional and culinary practices in india it is uh, to be noted that it is extracted with water and untouched by solvents it is standardized to contain turmerosaccharides the bioactive constituents of uh, the ingredient so we have gone uh, uh, beyond curcuminoids uh, from turmeric here we have uh, five clinical studies to support joint health uh, benefits of this ingredient including a human safety clinical trial you can see a uh, grass affirmation again here supports the safety the clinical studies are available in uh, two populations one in healthy individuals where the exercise induced pain has been studied along with muscle strength preservation in a couple of other studies we have evaluated the effect of turmeric in people having joint problems all the studies have been published in scientific journals and uh, you may seek a reprints from us in addition to solid dosage applications turmeric is ideal for functional beverages as well it's highly soluble in water and clean label certified with a very good uh, safety data support provided in our grass dosier
these are the joint health related claims that can be uh, you know supported with clinical trial results termasin works in dose ranging from 500 mg to 1000 mg on the digestive front we have uh, flavonoids of licorice captured in this uh, standardized extract of uh, you know extract uh, uh, derived from this plant it's known as uh, gut card it is uh, supported with three clinical studies for digestive health we have uh, looked at uh, two components in clinical studies one the functional dyspepsia characterized by a set of symptoms like heartburn abdominal pain and fullness etc we could see improvement over placebo in many of these symptoms the other was related to benefits in managing helicobacter pylori infections these studies also come with an extensive preclinical data to support the mechanisms of action yes uh, gut guard can be combined with the probiotics and digestive enzymes we have uh, data on both the physical compatibility as well as scientific rationale for value addition of gut guard in combination with probiotics gut guard works at a very low dose of 150 mg per day supported with clinical studies for digestive health benefits on the stress management side we have an ingredient derived from holy basil which has a great reputation in ayurveda as a stress relieving and adaptogenic plant osimum tenuiflorum is the scientific name of the plant and osibest is the standardized ingredient derived from the holy basil and uh, it is clinically studied for stress management many of the stress symptoms were studied in the clinical trial in osibest group over uh, placebo these included uh, sleep disturbances exhaustion etc associated with stress we could observe 1.6 times reduction in symptoms over the placebo osibest works at 600 mg uh, twice daily dose for managing stress symptoms forgetfulness feeling of exhaustion and sleep problems Finally, on the respiratory health front, uh, we have a polyherbal formulation derived from seven different plants of repute in uh, Ayurveda. Classical symptoms such as, uh, you know, nasal congestion, sneezing, got improved with the allergies in the placebo-controlled clinical trials. These studies uh, done here were uh, multi-centered with a large number of subjects. These studies are published and also supported with strong preclinical evidence. Allergies works at a dose of 660 mg twice daily for respiratory health support. Based on our clinical studies, we recommend this ingredient to be given for a period of 12 weeks for best results. Just a quick recap on what we have uh, discussed so far um, in this slide with the different uh, health areas that we covered. Overall, this is uh, the result of uh, more than 20 years of our scientific work at Natural Remedies. As you all know that there is uh, a lot of research happening now in academic circles on uh, botanicals on various aspects we are happy 
that the benefits of uh, Ayurvedic botanicals are now being scientifically substantiated and are available to people across the globe. Last but uh, not the least, environment, sustainability and people remain an integral part of our business and we are committed to continue to put our efforts here. Joy of uh, working with people and uh, contributing to society keeps us going at the back end. Global partners and customers that uh, we are proud of being associated with. Thank you all very much uh, for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Deepak. I am continuously so impressed by the work that Natural Remedies does to invest in science and bring the quality and the efficacy to the space. Thank you so much for outlining those specific ingredients and the clinical evidence that you have to support them. And I recommend that everyone connects directly with Dr. Deepak to get continue to get more information on the ingredients in the Natural Remedies portfolio. Thank you for that. And I also want to remind everyone we will have have a Q&A session at the end of this, so keep the questions coming. We'll have about 10 minutes and that these presentations are available in the document section at the bottom of your screen. So scroll down. If you don't see it, refresh your screen and you will see two presentations down there in the document section. Now our final presenter, Stefan Goffner, who is the Chief Science Officer at the American Botanical Council to talk about quality and authenticity around botanical ingredients. So thanks Stefan for being here and I'm going to turn it to you. Hello everybody and first and foremost, a healthy and happy 2021. I have been asked to uh, talk about uh, some authenticity challenges with a few herbal ingredients from Indian systems of traditional medicine. Next slide. But uh, for those who don't know, a brief introduction to the American Botanical Council. We're a nonprofit educational organization that provides information about the responsible and safe use of medicinal herbs. We have a wide variety of members, including consumers, healthcare professionals, researchers, educators, and we have support from the industry. And we have been around for over 30 years now. Next slide. Uh, an important part of my work at ABC is the ABC AHB and CNPR Botanical Adulterants Prevention Program which is a program to educate herbal and dietary supplement industry members about ingredient and product adulteration. We have two great partners uh, in the American Herbal Pharmacopeia and the National Center for Natural Products Research at the University of Mississippi. And next slide. It's not a slide, it's just a pop-up. Uh, we've uh, now in our 10 years uh, of uh, existence. Uh, the next slide will show some of the documents we have published today. These are the Botanical Adulterants Prevention Bulletin. And if you look at the lowest line, uh, you see that we actually have some of these uh, bulletins written on herbs from uh, traditional systems of Indian medicine like turmeric, boswellia, or ashwagandha. Next slide. Uh, I have to specify that if we talk about adulteration uh, in the context of uh, the Botanical Adulterants Prevention Program, we mean situations in which materials of inferior quality are added to or used as a substitute for the listed botanical ingredient. And that also includes the undeclared addition of active pharmaceutical ingredients. That's different from the definition by the US FDA who considered a product as adulterated when it has not been manufactured according to current uh, GMPs. Next slide. So that brings me uh, into the first uh, 
herb that I will discuss, which is andrographis, is primarily used for uncomplicated upper respiratory tract infections and inflammatory disorders. It's uh, in the US predominantly sold in the natural channel. It's not a top selling herb, but the sales have increased over the past years. Uh, interestingly, of course, because of its uh, effects in upper respiratory infections. Uh, the extracts are often standardized to block down diterpenoids, better known as andrographolites. And uh, there have been some authenticity concerns uh, raised due to the market presence of other andrography species. But uh, there is not a lot of published data. I did a literature search. Uh, there was one paper which looked at six samples from Indian markets, they didn't find any uh, adulteration there. And there was a paper where they looked at the samples in Thailand where 25% uh, or two out of eight samples contained a uh, closely related species. There are also concerns about uh, extracts that are devoid of uh, the active uh, marker compounds or the marker compounds uh, andrographolites. Uh, so we're not sure what the origin or what these are made of. The next slide. Uh, a little bit of a different situation with ashwagandha root and root extracts. Uh, the powder dried root is generally known as a, an adapter chain and had impressive sales increases in the United States in the past five years. In 2019, it was the fifth best selling herbal dietary supplement in the natural channel, number 33 in the mass market. The sales topped 20 million. Uh, with the extracts, they're usually standardized to vitanolites. And I have to stress here that it's not only the root extracts and the roots that are available in the US market, but uh, of recent root leaf extract combinations have become more popular. Next slide. So there are some papers that have looked at the supply chain and the quality of ashwagandha roots. Uh, the first was an investigation into markets from uh, local markets in India, from the Kerala area, and all of the samples were found to be authentic. These were all whole roots, so uh, probably less likely to be adulterated. Uh, several samples contained a mold, but that's more a contamination issue. Then there was a, another investigation into samples from an Indian markets, and that showed that about 20% were adulterated. And uh, some of the adulterants were uh, from other species, uh, completely unrelated. Uh, the methodology there, the DNA barcoding also is uh, not always uh, that reliable. So I, I have some, uh, I have to suggest that this data is taken with a salt of grain. And then there was a paper from 2014 looking at ashwagandha extracts, uh, showing that 70% uh, of the samples that were analyzed contained undeclared leaf extract. And that's a reason for concern. Uh, the leaf extracts are uh, less costly, also contain vitanolides. So uh, that uh, in often constitutes examples of economically motivated adulteration. The next slide will lead me into bacopa. Uh, bacopa is known as a brain herb. It's usually uh, taken to enhance cognition, memory, or for anxiety or depression. Again, predominantly sold in the natural channel, similar to andrographis, and not among the top selling herbs in the US. Uh, the Extracts are often standardized to bacocytes, and uh, there are some indications that uh, it's fairly frequently adulterated, not based off on economic concerns, but based on a vernacular name in India, uh, which is Brahmi, that is shared with uh, Gotukola or Centella Asiatica. So people tend to confuse these two. And so there are some reports that uh, these two herbs, Bacopa monieri and Centella asiatica are uh, substituted for each other. Uh, 
And then there is alleged adulteration with uh, Malva rotundifolia and Eclipta, Eclipta alba, but that needs to confirm it's in the literature, but I haven't really found any uh, robust data to uh, suggest that's actually happening. Next slide, please. I also want to uh, bring up Indian frankincense. I think it's an interesting uh, ingredient, has uh, seen a really rapid increase in sales from uh, 2013, 2017. And in the last two years, it uh, started uh, a little bit to decline, but still, if you look at the change from 2013, 2019, it's quite impressive. Uh, its main use is for inflammatory conditions and uh, has good clinical data that suggests that the boswellic acids are the active components. There are some papers that provide evidence that the clear cutting and livestock grazing on young trees have limited the availability of Boswellia trees. And uh, so it has become vulnerable in certain areas. And uh, it also, we have evidence that oleogum resins from other gum producing species and other Boswellia species are used as lower cost substitutes. Now, interestingly, there are also some high value Boswellia species from Africa uh, that are used in the fragrance industry. And uh, of recent, it seems that there have been some adulteration of these essential oils from uh, these precious uh, Boswellia trees from uh, Somalia uh, with Boswellia serrata. So depending on where the price pendulum swings, uh, Boswellia serrata is sometimes adulterated, but it's also used as an adulterant. Next slide. So this is one of the fun things I do in my spare time. I go to Alibaba and, and look at what kind of uh, wonky things are sold there. So you see that's an ISO hot selling high standard pure natural Boswellia serrata, Boswellia cartary extract. Uh, and uh, if you look at the product details, the product name is Boswellia serrata extract. The Latin name is Boswellia cartary. So whatever it is, a mixture, uh, I definitely wouldn't suggest to buy it because uh, the authenticity can be uh, quite challenging to establish here. Next slide. Uh, that leads me to the last ingredient, which is turmeric. Uh, Well-known uh, ingredient in food and dietary supplement industries uh, was the second best-selling herbal dietary supplement in 2000. 2019 in the natural channel, number four in the mass market, sales above 140 million, and its main use is for inflammatory conditions. Next slide. The, there are some supply chain challenges, and uh, that depends on the geographic area where turmeric is sold. Dry turmeric has a rough surface and dull color, so the roots are often polished to look more appealing. And if there are uh, shortcomings in the visual aspects, these are often improved by wet or dry coloring. And that's where the headache starts because the colorants are uh, usually not declared and some of them are fairly toxic, especially lead chromate. There are also reports of other curcuma species that are used as adulterants. And if you buy turmeric powder in bulk, Sometimes uh, rice, wheat, or other starches are uh, mixed in as bulking agents without being declared. Uh, more of a concern in Europe and the United States are the addition of synthetic curcumin to comply with standardization requirements. Next slide. So here we have some of the published data on turmeric adulteration. Uh, in India, there were two large scale investigations, one with 712 samples, the other with 253 samples, which both showed that uh, the addition of undeclared methanol yellow is fairly common. Uh, there is one investigation from Europe uh, where uh, approximately 12% uh, of the samples had either no curcuminates, was the wrong species, or had only curcumin, which is an indication that it's probably synthetic. 
Then uh, there were some indications uh, of adulteration with lead chromate. Uh, we had in the US 20 spice recalls between 2013 and 2016 due to elevated lead levels. And uh, just in 2019, there was a, a paper from authors that looked at markets in Bangladesh and showed that uh, elevated lead levels in pregnant women could be traced down to ingestion of turmeric that was adulterated with lead chromate. Next slide. Now, a uh, story also from 2019 uh, from Italy, where we had a cluster of uh, cases of hepatitis that were linked to uh, ingestion of turmeric supplements. So here in that uh, electronic newspaper, it's written that there were 21 cases with uh, 19 different dietary supplements. And the next slide, we actually had a collaboration with uh, someone from Italy who provided us with two of the products that were involved in this uh, hepatitis case, and we sent them to uh, the University of Illinois, Chicago for analysis. And here are the results uh, at the bottom, you see in red and pink, these are the two batches. Uh, both of them have basically five ingredients. Three are vitamins, B1, B2, and B6, and then we have curcumin and piperine. So this clearly shows that uh, these two products didn't contain a turmeric extract, because it was only curcumin in there. None of the other curcuminates that would you expect in a turmeric extract showed up. The same with the pepper extract that was on the label. It was only piperine in the product. So again, you would think that's probably made by chemical synthesis. Uh, next slide. So with that, I have uh, finished talking about turmeric and get to my last slide, which are uh, my expressions of gratitude to the BAP members, uh, staff at ABC, and to Luca Bucchini and Guido Paoli for their uh, help with the data on the turmeric products uh, from Italy. With that, uh, I close and I'm happy to answer any questions that may be. Thank you so much, Stefan. What a great way and important way to end this discussion today. And with that, I want to open it up to questions. I saw a couple rolling in in the chat. Once again, please submit your questions now. We have about 15 minutes to, to ask all of our presenters these questions. So thanks again to each of our presenters. And I want to get started with a question from Maria, which I touched on a little bit and I think many of our presenters did today, but let's talk a little bit more specifically about how to combat some of the skepticism around botanical ingredients efficacy. Maria asked, with some of the skepticism still out there, some manufacturers are really focusing on including vitamins or ingredients with approved claims by the FDA. How do you expect to see this evolve in the future, Stefan or... Um, Dr. Deepak, would either of you like to weigh in on how you see that evolving? Um, I'm happy to take the first shot at that question. Uh, great question. Uh, I don't see a change in the regulatory environment coming uh, regarding claims. But I, I thought, interestingly, the FDA has allowed in uh, July, I believe, of 2020, some limited claims for cranberry ingredients. So there, there are some ways now that manufacturers can support their uh, cranberry products with uh, health claims. And I could see that as a potential avenue also for other herbal ingredients. But uh, of course, we need to have sound science to support such health claims. Definitely, thank you. And, and Dr. Deepak, do you have anything to add to that um, specifically related to the science piece? Yes, uh, I see uh, the, the rigor of clinical trials to support uh, the claims is likely to increase as we move forward. 
uh, because more and more clinical trials are uh, seen on uh, dietary supplements. And uh, obviously it comes to a point where uh, uh, we would start looking for uh, the quality trials with objective parameters uh, towards making meaningful health claims. So I see uh, that as uh, uh, something you know coming there. Thank you so much, Dr. Deepak. And Claire and Eric, I don't want you to be left out either. And you may be able to weigh in a little bit. You, Claire, um, in your presentation, you talked about herbs and botanicals being a bright spot. And I know that we've seen that um, over the past couple of years. So does it seem to you that any skepticism out there isn't really having a negative impact on sales? You know, it doesn't seem to be reflecting in a huge way in the market. Like I said, we've seen this market growing at a pretty rapid pace and in most areas faster than other categories um, in the industry. And so it doesn't seem to be reflecting in the market on a mass level, although, um, of course, it's particular to certain ingredients. And I think as I was listening to this question and the other responses, an interesting thing that came to mind um, from what I've seen in the market is an example with CBD. And so, especially over the last year, we've seen a lot of companies launching formulas, incorporating hemp and hemp CBD into formulas with other ingredients to be able to make those claims and be able to have these like condition specific formulas. And so, you know, a mass trend in the market is this pivot to condition specific formulas and consumers seeking that out. And so I think CBD is a really good example of companies in innovating in that way or using that approach to kind of bring in other ingredients that they're able to make claims on um, to create these condition specific formulas. Interesting, thank you, Claire. And um, thanks for that example. It is interesting to see what's happening in that hemp CBD space with other um, herbal ingredients incorporated. Um, I think this question, Dr. Deepak, this one is for you, specific to gut guard. Can that be formulated as gummies or combined with probiotics and digestive enzymes? Oh, uh, yes. Um, in fact, uh, we have uh, generated data uh, both on a uh, formulation front as well as uh, uh, on the efficacy front uh, in terms of some of those uh, specific uh, uh, scientific evaluations and uh, some of this data is uh, already published. So uh, based on uh, the data generated, uh, uh, we can say that we have, a, uh, we have a rationale and a value proposition for combining gut guard with probiotics and uh, digestive enzymes. In fact, we also have a couple of uh, prototypes where uh, uh, gut guard got, uh, uh, you know, incorporated in gummies. So you can, uh, you can, you know, be rest assured that yes, yes, it, uh, it can be combined. Thank you. And another question for you and, and maybe shifting the conversation to immune health, because of course that's on everyone's mind while um, Claire, you pointed out, it's not the only booming category. It, it still is re very relevant. Um, another question for you, Dr. Deepak, can AP bio be formulated along with other immune health ingredients like vitamin D3, C and others? Yes. Uh, conceptually, the answer is yes. Uh, it, it appears like a good uh, proposition. Uh, as you know, like uh, agents like D3 are uh, uh, naturally synthesized uh, by the body uh, with some specific immune functions. Uh, AP bio can, uh, you know, support the actions of vitamin D3 or C uh, with its uh, unique balancing action on immunity and inflammation. You know, as discussed during the presentation, the clinical data on AP bio is available in both uh, healthy individuals for demonstrating its immunomodulatory actions, as well as, you know, in uh, situations needing anti-inflammatory actions such as common cold. So that way, like, uh, it kind of complements the actions of some of these vitamins. Thank you. And, and Claire and Eric, I've heard both of you talk a little bit about what you see as the future of the immune health category. Do you want to expand on, on that a little bit? Where do you see it going in, in 2021 and beyond? 
I can take a first stab at it. <laughs> um, you know, I think one of the things I pointed out in my presentation that's been really interesting in 2020 is that what we've seen in the market is that the it's really shifted to immunity being this gateway category into the industry. And so it used to be general wellness, targeted multivitamins. And it, this year, and we predict kind of for the future years that immunity is this gateway category. And so I think what'll be really interesting to watch and kind of where the innovation will be in 2021 and beyond is what companies can do to kind of draw consumers into maybe other health categories through that new gateway of immunity. And so, like I said, we you know, we think of these adjacent conditions as well. So things that are equally important to your overall health and help support your immunity. So sleep support, stress support, general wellness. And so um, thinking of these kind of immune adjacent conditions seems to be the next evolution of, of the, the trend of the low hanging fruit of immunity. Yeah. And I'll just add to that. Um, Claire, building off that idea of the uh, immunity adjacent spaces, um, I think there's also a really interesting and exciting opportunity, and we've talked about this in, in other forms, is the opportunity for immunity be, to become more of an everyday conversation or a year-round conversation, if not every day, as opposed to just a, a conversation about boosting uh, seasonally. And so the opportunity to connect this to, to more everyday elements of one's life also extends the opportunity to market beyond just boosting supplements to, you know, helping to maintain strong immune health and to make that sort of a year round conversation, as opposed to just something we talk about during cold and flu season. Thank you both. I see a question maybe for you, Stefan. Um, what are your thoughts on HPLC versus DNA barcoding for botanical ID testing? Are there situations where you would use one over the other, or you would recommend one over the other? Well, I'm a little bit biased because I spent a lot of time working with HPLC, so I love that technology, but they have both their uh, reasons to be. Uh, for me, both can answer different questions. Uh, the DNA barcoding approach and DNA uh, based approaches in general, I don't want to limit it to DNA barcoding or really answering the questions about identity. Uh, in particular, if you have crude raw material, it, it is a, a good tool for HPLC, the question can also about identity can also be answered in some instances, but uh, it also allows to quantify important constituents in an ingredient. And I think that's uh, where I see that the HPLC is really, really helpful uh, because it has these uh, both ap approaches. You can do identity, but also you can quantify uh, ingredients in, in uh, constituents in ingredients. So they're, they're different tools, both have their pros and cons and both are very useful for the herbal industry, I believe. Thank you. And Dr. Deepak, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I think uh, it was well, uh, well said by uh, Stefan. Uh, if you, uh, there is no doubt about the fact that uh, uh, people uh, are looking for both the uh, both the kind of techniques to be uh, kind of uh, becoming comprehensive in terms of identification. And as far as quantification is concerned, we will have to necessarily go for HPLC. Great, thank you. And I'll stay with you for another question very specific to natural remedies. Do you do any private labeling of your products? Well, uh, private labeling, uh, it, it can be, uh, you know, uh, it can be an option, uh, it can be considered. Uh, and uh, I think we need to discuss that as uh, uh, specific cases, uh, because it's a, it's a matter of uh, commercial discussions, maybe. Yes. Um, go ahead. So I would recommend, Farah, go ahead and connect with Dr. Dr. Deepak in Supply Side Network 365 and have a discussion. Anyone else who has very specific questions related to that um, connect with you directly, right, Dr. Deepak? Is that a good recommendation? 
That's right, Jessica. <laughs> I have one more question for you. Um, and then uh, Claire and Eric, I'll, I'll probably wanna ask you a little bit about this as well, but um, specific to you, Dr. Deepak, which ingredients can be formulated as food and beverages? Okay, uh, out of the ingredients that uh, uh, I presented, termacin and bacomind are the ideal uh, ingredients for uh, food and beverage formulations. Uh, they are, uh, you know, supported with the grass affirmations. Uh, we do have some uh, prototype drink samples made uh, from these ingredients. Uh, you can uh, contact us for uh, samples and for details. Thank you. And, and Claire and Eric, I was just wondering if from a trends and opportunities perspective, you have any insights around functional foods and beverages, particularly around any of the conditions, um, the trending conditions that you outlined? Yeah, at a, at a broad level, I'll, I'll let Claire speak to any data if she's got some, but, but at a broad level, that's a space that we've been watching trend for years. And I think that there continues to be an opportunity um, across categories to to bring functional food innovation to consumers who seem to be, uh, as we've been talking about in the trend, looking for more purposeful consumption and you know looking to to get value out of what they're consuming. So whether that's a a snack or a grab and go beverage um, or or a regular consumption sort of product, more substantial product, uh, bringing some functionality to categories has been a, a popular area of innovation that resonates with consumers. The only caveat I would say is that's kind of a longer term trend. I think certain categories, especially in the grab and go sort of refrigerated cold case, I don't have the, the sales data from spins right now, but my expectation is, is that is a, a slightly slower moving space right now, just because consumers are shopping a bit differently. But I, but I do expect, despite that, the longer term trend uh, to hold in the space. Yeah, I'll second that. I mean, our data shows, and I don't have the, the exact growth rates in front of me, but in recent years, certainly um, in certain categories, we've seen functional food and beverage growing at a faster rate than supplements. And when I say categories, I mean certain uh, functional ingredients. And so one area that's been really interesting to watch has been prebiotics and probiotics. I, I like to use that as a case study example of an area where we've actually seen such strong growth in functional food and beverage that it's affected the supplement market. And so I think immunity might be an interesting category to watch in that in that regard, just because it's such a hot category um, that we might see uh, across some of those certain ingredients, stronger growth in uh, functional food and beverage than in the, on the supplement side. Thank you both. And with that, I think we are about out of time. I want to remind everyone that this presentation will be available on demand. So next time you're in Supply Side Network 365, check it out. Also, we will make sure that all of the presentations are uploaded in the document section so that you can download the slides. And thank you so much to our amazing presenters today. Thank you to our sponsor, Natural Remedies. And thank you, of course, to everyone for taking the time out of your day and attending this session. I hope you learned a lot. I did. And um, once again, thank you all. Have a great day, night, and rest of 2021.